Our guest today calls herself a cross dresser for Christ. It's true. Cra we're crazy for the minge, Ginger Minge from RuPaul's Drag Race season seven. Welcome to Feast of Fun, hunty. Oh my God, the feast consisted of chicken and potato soup. It was delicious. <laughs> we homemade. fed you. You did. You f it was homemade. Homemade. And you did feed me because I'm sick. I know. Poor baby's got the flu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick. <laughs> so let's get sickening. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, are you feeling okay or what's wrong? Well, I don't know. I think I've got like the stomach flu or something. I don't know. I've been traveling a lot. I was just in Iowa with Sasha Bell for her, her birthday weekend. Aww. And if, if you don't know, Iowa is actually Portuguese for drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and I found that out the hard way. Well, they drink a lot in Iowa? That, that's all they do is drink in Iowa. Well, there's nothing else to do. I guess. I don't know. We've Meth is also very big in Iowa, too. Oh, but see, I like my teeth. Yeah. I, I want to keep lovely them. Teeth. Let me, let me you. smile for the camera. <laughs> so today's show is uh, simulcast on YouTube, so you can actually see Ginger Minch out of drag, which is a real uh, I look plus. like Chucky. It's a, plus. it's a real plus, a plus size. Yeah. Well, can you do uh, your best uh, Chucky impersonation in the voice? Want to play? No, that's, about it. that's about as good as yeah, it gets. That's really good. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's mostly foreplay. Uh, uh, Chucky and uh, Jennifer Tilly are are your spirit animals for your drag persona. Are they? Are they? Are well, they? you, you work said it. Well, you work it into your act. Well, because I have to play off my strengths. I don't got many of them. I got to go with it. <laughs> no, if I had to pick like a spirit animal, I would think I would be Fat Amy from Pitch Perfect. Oh, Aww. that's good. That's yeah. my spirit animal. I you just want to lay down and do running like that. The actress who plays Rebel. Fat Amy, uh, Rebel Wilson, uh -huh. is roommates with the guy from uh, Little Britain. Little Matt Britain. Lucas. They Matt, actually yeah. do live together. That's crazy. That's like like it, you know real life and fantasy coming together, right? <laughs> yeah, but could you imagine what the hell like that would be? Like I, you keep like walking down the hallway and think you see yourself coming at you. You're like, <laughs> wait a second, is that a mirror I'm walking into? <laughs> well, RuPaul and Lady Bunny did live together for some time mm -hmm. when and, they were drag queens. And I'm amazed that either one of them are still kicking today because of it. <laughs> oh my god, we went on the uh, the kickoff tour mm -hmm. for the premieres and Bunny and Katya and Trixie and myself went out to lunch the first day. And Bunny, <laughs> oh God, I had never sat down and talked to her before, but she wanted to sit down and just tell us all of these terrible stories about her and Rue from their days together. And you, it's those kinds of stories. You sit there and go, how are you still alive? Yeah. <laughs> what did she say? I can't, I cannot repeat Oh, that. really? They sucked no. a lot of dick back in the day, as from yeah. what I understand. <laughs> Probably each other's. I don't know. <laughs> No, I don't think they were did any kai kai action. Well, you, it, apparently they didn't know what what they were doing and what end was up most of the time. Now, Ginger Minge yeah. was a name that was actually given to you. It was because you were a working are continue to be a working actor, and you've been on. You're the only drag queen actually that's gotten jobs on Broadway from well, drag. Yeah, race. well, well, I didn't get jobs on Broadway. You played the as fork a in in uh, uh, what is it, Beauty and the Beast? I mean, Beauty and the Beast. I was a dancing fork for a year and a half, <laughs> a place setting, if you will. Um, no, I did that. Uh, this was all way before drag was even a uh, thought in my little brain, you know. Yeah. Um, see, I grew up in theater. I started when I was six months old. My mother kind of volunteered me to be the baby in a local production of Fiddler on the Roof, Aww. and I just grew up with it. I did national tours. Um, I started as Oliver in Oliver the Musical and then graduated to the Artful Dodger when I got too old for Oliver and did that for a while. You're a child actor. I was. I did was. you do any toothpaste ads or like juice box ads or anything like that? <laughs> no, but I did a series of Christian movies. You for, did? For well, children. What were they? It was called they? the Treasure Box series. And they all filmed in Orlando, which was the big city to me because I was born in Leesburg, which is about an hour north of Orlando. And uh, for some reason, they like... They came to see my children's theater group that I was in. They liked me and they cast me. And I did this whole series. Um, my, but my starring role was as Paul in Blinded on the Road to Damascus. <laughs> <laughs> it was a riveting portrayal Aww. of something. I don't so even know what the hell it was about. So you were a little kid playing Paul the Apostle? Yes. <laughs> the and whole thing blind? was like, like kids reenacting these famous... Bible stories. Is any of the stuff like available in Christian bookstores? Anywhere? I hope not. 
<laughs> I hope not. Now that you're saying this, you're kind of putting this out there. So <laughs> your diehard fans. I will do that go. a lot. I put out. I put out more than I can or should <laughs> legally. So you, unlike a lot of kids that were in show businesses as kids, you stuck with it. Yes. And what is it that like from because some kids resent their parents putting them into show business. But for you. Oh, no, I resent my parents for many other reasons. It has nothing to do with show business. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you really love to perform. And, and as a I kid, do. even though you grew up in the in the system, sort of be you had an agent, I guess. or Yeah. And so what made you want to, like, stick with that as an adult? Is it because you're, like, hooking is hard or selling drugs? <laughs> <laughs> well, harder? I didn't want to stick with it as an adult. I mean, I, I've, I've never really talked about this. So here's an exclusive story for you. The whole reason I stopped doing Beauty and the Beast is because I had a mental breakdown. Like, I just couldn't handle it anymore. I did it for a year and a half, and I needed to get out of New York. I needed to stop doing the same routine I was doing day after day after day. You were 19 at the time? I was, um, I was just about to be 20. Mm-hmm. When that happened and um, I just I left I left and I went back home and I said I don't want to do it anymore so I knew that if I was going to continue to be an entertainer of some sort that I needed to reinvent that Um, I didn't want to be stuck doing the same exact thing day after day after day is that when you got involved in drag yeah well I kind of just stumbled into it Um, after a couple months of being back I was like well let me just put myself out there, see what I can find in the theater world. The only thing that they were um, casting for was an original play called Boys, Boys, Boys at um, the Orlando Fringe Festival. And they wanted eight boys who um, were buff and could go fully nude, which was not me, (laughs) or two drag queens. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't know. I've never done it, but (laughs) it can't be that hard, can it? So I auditioned, and by some crazy twist of fate... It must have been a str- Oh, wait, we, can we sing on your Yeah, podcast? of course, go for it. Okay. It must have been a strange twist of fate. Um, That's I not singing. <laughs> no. That's just, you just said a little phrase. <laughs> I'm, That's okay. I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have to audition in drag? Because you hadn't done voice. drag before. I did. I yeah. had, to, and I borrowed my grandmother's wing and a dress from my mom and shoes from my sister and then I stopped at Big Lots to find some kind of makeup because I had no clue what I was doing. But um, I just I sat down and luckily I had had some kind of theatrical makeup experience. Mm-hmm. So I just figured it out as best as I could. And do I look like pictures a, of that. Yeah, I do. And they are under lock and key. Oh, come because on. I look like a cracked out Carney Wilson. Uh, <laughs> Everybody starts somewhere. <laughs> but it worked. I mean, it worked. And I'm proud of it because it, it has led me to where I, I've kind of landed today. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of people are betting. There, you know, there's betting pools, just like horses or sports. Betting or betting? They're betting, betting money. Oh, I, I get more excited for the betting. You're, you're in the, in the top tempers. five most likely to win this season of RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh, is my mom running a betting pool or something? <laughs> She's betting against you. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Knowing her, probably. But, I mean, that must feel really good that just, uh, that you've sort of been working in theater for all this time, and now your career is a very different place. Well, it's, it's in a place that I never expected it to be. Um, how could, wh- how, what would you describe that place that you're in now? I wish I could describe it, but it's changing every day. Um, I was in Iowa yesterday morning and then flew back to Orlando to do a viewing party last night and then got back on the plane and came to Chicago today. So it's kind of like this this life that um, has always sounded very interesting, but I never thought I would have the chance to to live out. And um, when you're younger and, and you say, oh, my God, I want to be a superstar. I want to be a jet setter. I want to do this and I want to do that. It's very different in your head than when you're actually doing sure, it. Yeah. Because the food on the road is really usually really lame. Yeah. Well, the food, you know, when you remember to eat, yeah. the food is never as good as you want it to be. You, you sleep on the plane now, which, thank God, they have pillows on Delta. I'm very, <laughs> very excited about that. Um, and blankets. I think they're blankets. I don't know quite what they are. They're just big cum rags. <laughs> well, they were a little stiff. Well, and, and, and I guess being a drag queen is very different than being an actor where you're sort of performing the same 
job day after day after day. And here it's it's a, a lot about spontaneity. Yes. Absolutely. And do, are you doing your own makeup at this point in your career? Or, or? Yeah. Well, I've always done my own makeup. Good, bad or indifferent. I'm the one that does it because to me, like, I know that a lot of drag queens are they are a character and then they are a real person and they're two very separate entities. That's not what I'm about. I think that Ginger as a character is just an extension of Joshua personality wise. So I want to make sure that the aesthetic kind of matches that at all times. Well, why even use a drag name? Why? Well, because I like it. You like Ginger better than Joshua? Because, you know, RuPaul uses his own name. Willem uses his own name. A lot of drag queens. Chad Michaels. Chad Michaels. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's great. But um, I think that, you know, in order to achieve the level of characterization that I want for for that persona, I really, really think that the name is necessary. And the name was given to you. It was given to me. Um, and Are I, you considering other names? Well, no, because when I, I, I had done the show yeah. at the uh, the Fringe Festival and then a director for Sleuth's Mystery Dinner Theater over in Orlando, which has been there for 30 years, they came to see me uh-huh. and ended up hiring me to go work at Sleuth's. And if you're going to work there as a boy, you've got to be willing to play boys and girls because you'll start the show as a boy, you'll get killed, you'll come back as a woman. It's like Greater Tuna. from You've seen yes. that production, yeah, right? Yeah, I've done that. I've oh, done you have? Of I've even done Red, White, and Tuna. Try getting the, the rights for that. That's hard. Uh, <laughs> and so am I right now. Shout out to, you know, everybody thinks they're dead, but the, those two guys that started it are still alive. What happened to them? Do you know? I don't know. Because I, I love them so much. I jo- love them too. Jason, Joe Sears and Jason Williams. Yep. Mm-hmm. Brilliant comedic drag legends. And they never get talked about. But in the South, they're huge. They are. Yeah. A lot of things are huge in the South. I'm huge in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, what of all these ro- I mean, you've done so many remarkable roles. You, you're the only man to play Mrs. Lovett ever in a production, uh, an official production of Sweeney Todd. Yeah. What is, what is your favorite role you've ever taken well, besides being Ginger Minch? Well... Um, I think it, 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 there's a really close race for that because um, I got to play Arnold in Torchlong Trilogy. And when I was growing up, you know, the in Leesburg, there was very little as far as gay culture goes. So I remember going to the gas station that also rented movies um, with my grandmother when I was younger and seeing the, the VHS for Torchlong Trilogy. I didn't know what it was about, but something told me, just get it, just get it and watch it. So I convinced her it was a family movie. She rented it for me. I was about 11 years old at that point, and I watched it on a loop. And we'd go back and we'd rent it week after week after week, and it kind of helped me discover who I was on the inside and and that what I was was okay. Um, So all the time that I was growing up, I said, I just, I really want to play that role. I feel like it's shaped me into the human being that I am. I think that it it would be irresponsible if I didn't at least try to tackle it. It's a good thing that Showgirls didn't shape you into the person that you are. (laughs) Oh my God, Showgirls is the best movie ever, (laughs) ever. But you have to watch the director's cut. Oh, Uh, without a doubt. What's in the director's cut that's not in the regular film? Everything. Like what? Well, the uh, the film is so fucking filthy. I know. They yeah. had to cut all of it out. Well, the place you don't want to watch it is on Logo, because on Logo, they cut out the lesbian kiss. <laughs> Could you imagine on the but gay VH1 station? VH1 yeah. likes to put the, the spray-painted bras on. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know what? I, it's the same one, I think, because it's oh, the same company. It? Yeah, they show the same one. Tell us well, about how you got to play Ginger, Mrs. Lovett, though. Ginger, let what? me see your nails, darling. They're, oh, they're Mine nice. are as nice as yours. You yeah. think you could do my nails sometime? <laughs> well, then again, I'm getting a little old for that hoary look. <laughs> Close the, I've always wanted to do that. Thank you. For You're indulging very me. welcome. Tell us how you got to play Mrs. Well, Lovett. no, oh, I will. But let <laughs> me say, before we What's move that? on from Showgirls. What? Does, and she is acting her ass off in that movie, Elizabeth Berkley. Yes. She, she was, is yeah. uh, sitting there. She's like, I'm Oscar worthy. And you could tell that she's the only one that wasn't in on the joke. Everybody knew what exactly what the movie was, except for her. You want to know some little tidbit? Uh, Rena Riffle, who plays Penny Hope in uh-huh. the movie, said uh, we asked her about this, and she said that Elizabeth Berkeley was kind of a sociopath, right? What was the 
Uh, I forget exactly how it was, but it was it was a private conversation. So well, I we shouldn't think. probably talk. Well, no. I'm talking about it anyways. But <laughs> but basically, that's just saying that she had a really hard time like relating to other people on an emotional level. Yeah, it was hard and it was difficult. And she says rehearsals were really weird with her. Well, how the hell could she not be weird? I mean, coming out of Saved by the Bell for those many years, that's a drastic jump yeah. from Jesse Spano, the feminist, to. Know me Malone. She she was excited in either role, and she can't hide it. <laughs> no, and she's so <laughs> scared. And unfortunately, she's really not embraced her role in Showgirls. She feels like it torpedo her career. Well, well, it did for sure. Yeah, but it could have skyrocketed as well if she had yeah. just owned it. Like, um, oh God, I, I'm I'm not feeling well, and I can't think about things right now. <laughs> Mommy Dearest. Yes. Joan Crawford. Jo- Faye yeah, Dunaway. Faye Dunaway. Yeah. She's the same way with Mommy Dearest. She won't talk about it. She won't. I'm like, come, that is what is going to keep you legendary. You need to own it and just. Well, couldn't you say that the, some of the queens on Drag Race who don't get a favorable edit or put their foot in their mouth, like. Like me. Know, well, I think you're actually doing really well. <laughs> well, you got into trouble this week, right? Because of something that you. Oh about God! What well, I will say right now that two of my best friends from the show are Katya and Trixie. But you, but you were like mean to them. In I wasn't that episode. mean. I wasn't mean. What did you say? I don't even remember. Well, there was an entire conversation that wasn't shown. But you know, I don't blame anything on editing, only because they filmed two, two and a half, three hours sometimes of untucked footage, and you got to cut it down to twenty-two minutes. You and called Katya a cock-hungry whore. Oh no, no, no! I was, ju- I was just um, <laughs> explaining to the world what she was, <laughs> and pretty much what her character is. Uh, no, Trixie uh, and I were having a conversation about um, basically what the parameters of Jet Set Eleganza were. And it was the, the, the airline stewardess yeah. thing. That, that, it, Aryan she, Airlines. Yeah, well, we want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> and so you were like, uh, we're diverse. We're, we have people well, of and color we, and that thing. Well, no, I didn't Black people, people like me, damn it. <laughs> well, but here's the thing. I, I grew up mostly in, you know, in an ethnic community. Yeah. So th- those are the type of people that I naturally. And they grew up in you. <laughs> yeah, they grow <laughs> up, grow in. Never mind. Um, but. When I was picking the team, yes, I wanted a team that was diverse, but I also wanted to get as many uh, talented performers sure. as I could. And like I knew Kennedy. Um, Kennedy is really impressive. For people who haven't seen seen her perform live, mm-hmm. she, they're not she showing that. I grew up with Kennedy. I mean, I've known her down. for yeah. years and years yeah. and years. So I knew exactly what she could give. I knew Sasha. Um, I will say that Sasha Bell. Yeah, she didn't really get to. Um, Frisbee. Express herself as well as Let's I call think her she Frisbee. Should. Frisbee. <laughs> that was Frisbee. her original drag name, her right? Her original drag <laughs> it name. It sure was. Um, I, don't, I don't think that what she did on Drag Race really kind of represents who she is as an entertainer because I've known yeah. her outside of that, and she's so incredible when you go and see her at the club. But, you know, I'm not the first person to say that a good drag queen does not mean you're going to be good on Drag Race and vice versa. Okay. Um... So you book but people I who wanted are her. I wanted her because I knew how she was. I yeah. wanted Kennedy because I knew how she was. And then I filled in around that with what I had been able to see up to that point. And it just happened that we were incredibly diverse. <laughs> and then the other team, <laughs> just aesthetically speaking, was not. Okay. Um, and Aryan Airlines was meant as a joke. Everyone got that it was a joke. It was the editors going dun, 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 with the music and then, <laughs> well we yeah. always rec- you know and RuPaul likes her little racist jokes you know, <laughs> she's a fan of Shirley Q Licker and we always recommend to drag queens who are trying out for, for drag race put something a little bit racist in your in your video because <laughs> that'll get Ru's attention because well, you know? and- like Trixie did like I'm, I'm Native American hi how are ya yeah. <laughs> and Ru's probably like Booked. <laughs> uh, I told her, I said, you missed a golden opportunity with your, your cover girls video. Mm-hmm. You should have done Geronimo as in the full Native American get up. Oh. <laughs> but she could have gotten away with it because, yeah. I mean, she is Native American. So. Right. Well, and so I think most Native Americans have a good sense of humor about their own sort of cliches and stereotypes. Do they? Uh, like, you know, some uh, people have different relationships to their own cliches and stereotypes. And so some people do and some people don't. Uh huh. You know, although I called a, what is it, a uh, Shim Shang Song, a kimono on, on Reddit. <laughs> and I, 
I did you got get it? Did you get you. red to fill? I got red it to fill. To fill. Yes, But well, that's okay. I mean, I love Reddit. I'm going to state, for the record right now, I love Reddit. There have been some incredible people on there that have been very supportive of me. And, of course, there's, you know, there's a handful of just assholes who, mm. you know, all of us are getting our fair share. Like, there's sure. 90% love and 10% hate with everything, and that's fine. Um, but Reddit is the one that has kind of <laughs> come for me after they felt that I came for Trixie. Oh, so let me tell you. I'm, yes. I'm trying to tell you the story. Um, so when we were out there for judging, they only show a little bit of the judging and the critiques. Yeah. So uh, basically, Michelle made it very clear that to her, Jet Set Eleganza meant that something it was something that you would wear if you were in first class. Okay. If you were a passenger in first class mm-hmm. not a traveling the world, not a flight attendant. So the only thing that I was asking Trixie about as far as her outfit went, I even prefaced it by saying, I love your outfit. I think it's fantastic. But can you tell me, just by what they're telling us out there, how is that more Jet Set Eleganza than what I'm wearing? Mm. Not that I think mine is Jet Set Eleganza. I had a different Jet Set Eleganza that ripped right before I went on stage. Oh, really? Yes. I had a full suit that I had made for, I had had made for Continental Plus. Um, and, and then you picked up, and everything. You, you dropped your keys and so you bent over to pick it up. And No, I had dropped some weight since oh, you we got had gotten skinny. there. I was, I was losing weight um, just because of... The, the type of schedule that they keep us on, yeah. the the diet that they feed us is totally different than what I'm used to. So, I mean, there was no fried chicken. That's basically what I'm saying. There was no mm-hmm. fried chicken. I heard Jasmine brought two suitcases full of food, and you guys were all pissed because she was feeding you guys. Why were we? Oh, when she got eliminated? Yeah, when she got eliminated, everyone was like, God damn it, there goes the cold cuts. And the- <laughs> well, no, she was nice enough to leave it. She even left the hot sauce, girl. She did. She did. She, nice literally, she really brought food with her. She did. Well, you know, she only wears crop tops and really tight skirts. <laughs> so she only needed one suitcase for all of her wardrobe. So she filled the rest with <laughs> snacks and goodies and everything. Mm. That, that's that's a brilliant way to like win yourself over so to how'd the girls. So how would your outfit rip? What happened? So uh, Kennedy and I were trying to to fold the zipper over and then tack it, and then the whole back of it just we we pulled the wrong string and the whole back busted out, and we had about five minutes left. I said, Kennedy, just go over to my suitcase, grab whatever stretches, and I'll defend it on the runway. And she came back with a fucking cocktail dress. And I was like, okay, I've got my work cut out for me, but we'll make this work. So anyway, um, cut to untucked. That was all I was saying was you look like a Jetsons flight attendant, and that's a fantastic costume. But just going based on what Michelle said, how is that more valid than this? That was it. It was a discussion. We talked about it. We laughed about it. We moved on. And then I will say this right now. I, I had called her out. They're calling it my Laganja moment. because You felt very attacked. I did feel... Well, it wasn't even feeling very attacked. Um, we had lined up in the workroom to go over to the main stage for the challenge. And all the cameras had already repos- uh, repositioned. Yeah. So there were no cameras there. And their team was lined up in front of ours. We're ready to go over. And um, I hear Trixie say something about, um, do you think we'll be okay? How do you think we're going to do? And there was another girl on the team. And Violet actually came forward and said it was her that said it. um, That said, of course we're going to win. Look at us and look at them. We're polished and they're a mess. (laughs) I don't care. I realize it's a game. I realize that we're drag queens and we're supposed to be catty and funny and whatever. Um, But A, there were no cameras there to catch it. So why bother? And B, like, just own it. Just say it. Don't try to whisper it. That was the only thing that I was saying was who said it. Let's talk about it. And if you want to say anything else, say it and make it a thing and be funny and we'll all move on. But well, it does kind it feel like they're making in, mountains out of molehills and, 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 to a certain extent? Well, everyone needs to just realize it's a television show. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, yes, it's, it's there to play up the drama. It's there to create a very interesting story arc and storyline. And if it was just us sitting around braiding each other's fake hair and eating haagen it would be so fucking boring. I wouldn't mind watching that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay tuned. <laughs> now, you, as a young gay guy, were you were born in Leesville, Louisiana. No. No? That's wrong. I was born in Leesburg, okay. Florida. 
Okay, so I was because I was googling where Leesburg is. I knew somebody was googling me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you were born. So you always were born in Florida, but at the age of eighteen, like Madonna and Michelle Visage, you moved to New York City. I did without a dime in your pocket. No, I had. My, oh, I had nothing in my my pocket. Okay. Uh, what had happened was my roommate Adrian and I. And Adrian, um, she and I decided that. On my 18th birthday, we were going to sell everything that we owned, yeah. and we were just going to take the cash and move up to New York. And so I sold my car. Everything that was not bolted down was sold. I shoved all the I had about $8,000 between the two of us, shoved it in a backpack, got on a plane, went to New York, didn't have a place to stay, didn't have a job, didn't have anything. We were stupid. We were kids, mm-hmm. and we were living the dream. Um, so we, we eventually, you know, we bounced around from, like, hostel to hostel for a while, um, which was fun, and I wouldn't trade it because it was a great experience. And then eventually found um, we were renting a room up in Spanish Harlem. This tiny little room, not it, what probably year half are we the size talking of this. Here? This is, I don't, two thousand three, two thousand four, wow. somewhere around. Girls are all so young. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wasn't that yesterday? <laughs> Isn't it sad? I'm I'm like one of the founding members the of the old bitter queen. old lady brigade. <laughs> you're like, in 2013, I was 18 years old. <laughs> I was like, oh Jesus. Oh, you poor. Well, well, were you scared? I mean, was it terrifying living in New York City like that, or? Um, no, because I was young and stupid. And then you just auditioned until you got a, a job? No, no, no. I walked around. Um, well, we had got that room and we were paying $500 a week for a room that was half the size of the studio mm-hmm. right here. And uh, we knew that it, we were eventually going to go through the money that was in the backpack. So we needed jobs. Um, we went everywhere. I, I applied at movie theaters. I applied at beauty supply stores because I had gone to beauty school. For a little bit until I dropped out. Uh, <laughs> What'd you do with the money for the lessons? <laughs> I didn't have any more. I was poor. <laughs> um, and I was walking by the stage door of the Lump Fontan Theater, yeah. where Beauty and the Beast had transferred and been playing there forever. And there was a stagehand outside smoking. So I went up and I asked him if I could have a cigarette. And he gave me one. And then I uh, asked him if, he, if I could have a light. And he gave me one of those, and he said, is there anything else, Your Majesty? And I said, yeah, bitch, a job. (laughs) I need a job. So he laughed, and he said, I like your style, kid. He took me floor to floor, and he uh, got me a job in merchandising. Oh. And Disney on Broadway has this, like, amazing policy that uh, anybody who's involved with the company can perform with the cast at, like, special events, like Broadway and Bryant Park and and, um, Broadway Cares, any of those. They can do those. So I was doing that, and I ended up playing, uh, uh, singing a lot of the lines of the character of LeFou, the sidekick from Gaston. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the producers. No one sucks like Gaston. No one fucks (laughs) like Gaston. You know that. You know it so well. That was my audition piece. Uh, The sucking and fucking mostly. Um, (laughs) One of the producers was there when I was filling in in the park one day. And said, you know, we've got an audition coming up. I was impressed. Take my card. I'm going to tell them you're coming. So I went to this audition. Had no clue what the hell was, like, in front of me. I I didn't expect anything of it. You know, I was like, oh, he's just being nice. Mm -hmm. I was young and thin and pretty then, so I didn't fucking care. I was like, oh, whatever. Uh, I walk in, and, you know, they're very nonchalant. They don't care until they find out who sent me. And they're like, oh, Kevin sent him. Okay, okay, okay. So I do the audition, and I think I've blown it or whatever, and I'm ready to leave. And they said, okay, well, um, you're going to go into the show this weekend. I was like, go go into it, what, like to watch it? And they're like, no, 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 no. You go into the show for the Saturday matinee. This was like a Wednesday. So it was like Showgirls. Yeah, it's you very start, much like you start that. start Saturday. And you didn't have to push anybody down the stairs? No, not, not at thrusted. all. <laughs> Ugh, PK turn, no me, PK turn. <laughs> Do a PK turn, Ginger. <laughs> so I, I ended up like going into crash rehearsal mode and just started the show. And I did that for a year and a half. Wow. So, so how did down. you get Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney Todd? Because that's a, a, I know a you really want to talk one. about this. Why? Well, just because people, <laughs> there's people like that heard the question before and like, when's that going to answer? If we don't answer it, they'll be pulling. Oh, I'm their sorry. Hair. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's Mrs. actually Mrs. Lovett, the only man ever to play Miss, that we know of in an official. Capacity. Well, yeah, I, I will say I may not have been the only man that's played it, but I'm the only one with the stamp of approval. Um, 
what had happened with that was a very good friend of mine was directing the production of Sweeney Todd. He had cast a woman as Mrs. Lovett, and there was uh, a man playing Sweeney. The two of them, something happened, and he um, pushed her down the stairs. It was a small theater. There were no stairs, <laughs> just in the parking lot. Uh, <laughs> ran in her front down. of a bus. Ran her down. That's my Mean Girls moment. Um, <laughs> so she had an accident. Well, no. And so she, the Sweeney got really, really sick. Okay. Mm-hmm. And had to drop out. And this was a week before the show, and she didn't feel comfortable, like moving on to a new Sweeney. So she quit. Oh. Yeah, and he called me and he said, I know you've played Toby twice. I know it's one of your favorite shows. If you know it well enough, can you come in and do it? And then he said that he was going to get uh, Stephen Jones, who had played Sweeney when I'd played Toby 10 years prior. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew Stephen's approach to the character, to the show. I felt like I could be comfortable enough going into it with him with that short of amount of time. Um, so we go into rehearsal the next day and we get a cease and desist letter from Music Theater International saying, you can't do this. You cannot use a man for Mrs. Lovett. Who ratted you guys out? I mean... Well, I told um, the director, Derek, I told him to make sure that he sent away for approval. Okay. Because I'd spent my whole life in theater. I've directed, I've produced, Mm -hmm. I've done all that. I know that you need to go through the proper channels because you don't want it to come back and bite you in the ass in the end. Sure. So he sent them... The, that letter, and they sent it back immediately. We don't think that'll be a problem. But then, like, the next day, the cease and desist comes. Um, and I understand. They're just trying to cover their ass, you know? They said, if you want to do this, you need to contact the Sondheim estate, and they have to approve it. It can't come through us. This is right before Christmas. So everybody's out of the country. Everybody's off doing their own thing. I hurt my knee and had to go in for knee surgery sure. during this week. And so everything seemed to be happening, but we got word that we needed to film me doing portions of the show and send it in and then into Sondheim's estate. And they looked through everything and I got a letter back saying, you're approved. You can't do it as Joshua. You have to bill yourself as, uh, as Ginger. Cause we told them that, you know, well, he has a drag persona and this is this and And they said, so long as you play it completely as a woman, you have my approval to do it. Wow. So I recovered from my knee surgery in time to do final dress rehearsal. I had two rehearsals and then did the show. <laughs> and you've also played Seymour and won an award for a little shop of horror. I did. I played Seymour five times. Mark has a good version of that. <laughs> Breed me, Seymour. Breed, Breed me <laughs> all night long. <laughs> must become. Uh, uh, must be fresh. Uh, ooh, well, you would hope so. Must be hard. It'd be uh, awful dusty. <laughs> <laughs> Crunchy. What's that? What? Because uh, that's one of my personal favorite musicals. Little Shop. Yeah. I've got three favorites. I've got Little Shop of Horrors. I've got um, Sweeney Todd and Tommy. Oh really? Have I you ever played Tommy? No. You played the the uh, Tina I w- Turner. Character. I want to play the acid queen. That's what I was gonna say. I want to play the acid queen. Yeah. So bad. Tina Turner. I was addicted to her growing up. Like on a lot of levels, I feel like she saved me mm. when I was younger because um, 1993, when What's Love Got to Do with It came out, I had never really heard of Tina Turner. Um, but this movie comes out of this little country girl who reaches superstardom and it's not an easy path, but she eventually just like crushes everything and is a world famous superstar. And that's going to be me. I'm going to be Tina Turner. Watch just short, fat, white. I can beat me. (laughs) I remember when she turned 40 and everybody made a big deal about her turning 40 and like, look how good she looks. And she's 40. And look at her at (laughs) 78 now. And still looking good. Still looking good. But I was so obsessed with Tina Turner that in my mind, I guess it's a lot like these Drag Race fans. They see it, mm-hmm. and to, in their head, it's happening right then. Like, this didn't happen a year ago, or this didn't happen 20 years ago, or whatever the case may be with the situation. But I'm watching this movie just in my head going, Ike Turner's a terrible person, and he's beating her all the time, and he's doing this. So I went on a quest to find his phone number. Ike Turner. To Ike Turner. This is back when he was <gasps> to still To give alive. him a piece of your mind. To give him a piece of my mind. <laughs> Did you find it? 
I did. It took me like three and a half weeks, but I finally found How'd his phone number. How'd you find number. his number? I just kept calling information after information after information, and they would transfer me to different And he's different listed places. as uh, Ichabod Turner or something. <laughs> it's like what? Well, he, I found his um, his publicist. Yeah. And I told him I'm the, I'm the biggest fan of Ike Turner. I really want to get an <laughs> autograph. I really want to talk to him. I really want to do this, that, and the other thing. So they set up a phone meeting with him with me. <gasps> And hello, yeah. <laughs> so he starts, and I was like, "Mr. Turner, I just want to tell you one thing." And then my dad walks in the room, and who are you talking to? Yeah, Joshua? he's like, "Who are you talking to?" Ike Turner. Ike sure Turner. You are. Well, so I'm going off, and I'm telling him, "You're a nasty motherfucker. I can't believe you beat her. I hate you. You're you <gasps> just on and on and on and on." <laughs> and then my dad comes in the room. He's like, "Who are you talking to?" <laughs> Ike Turner. <laughs> And he's like, no, give me the phone. He said, who is this? He said, this Ike Turner. Who the fuck is this? <laughs> so I was grounded for like a year and Your a half. Your father grounded you because you were yelling at a celebrity. Uh, yelling at Ike Turner. Did Ike Turner like hang up on you or something? No. Or well, my dad hung up the phone. after. Like, Did your we dad don't want know any. who Ike Turner even was? Yeah, of course okay, he knew. Okay. I was um, when I tell you obsessed with Tina Turner, obsessed <laughs> with Tina Turner. What advice do you have for the fans of Drag Race who may get angry? Please at- don't call me and curse me out. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> That's so funny. You know, I said in the interviews, and I think I said this with you guys when when we were talking during the, the premiere carpet, party. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of red carpet, uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I had mine ripped up. It's hardwood floors. It's much easier to clean. Do you shave your? Are you saying you shave your balls? I never followed up. Balls. With that. Yeah. My outside ovaries. Okay. So you ripped up your carpet. <laughs> Got hardwood floors. I would interpret as. You yeah. shave your nuts. Yeah, it's a joke. Okay. Mostly. Mm, not a very funny one. <laughs> no, no, none of mine are. <laughs> Just ask Reddit. No. Oh, <laughs> let me give you a little sad slide whistle. <laughs> no, that was great. That was really sad. I see you've spent no expense. It's this fantastic. is a really nice. It is, That's actually. That's one of the most expensive ones you can get. Oh, well, yeah. I don't know. I've never been in the market for a slide whistle. You, so what advice would you give to little kids who are pissed off at... A drag, their you know their favorite drag queen for insulting, dissing, disrespecting them, their favorite girl, and they want to give you a piece of your their mind. Um, well, you know, I think that's great. I think that no matter how it manifests itself, I think it's wonderful that people are so passionate about it because it keeps Drag Race, you know, kind of on its own level. Sure. Um, the fans are so passionate either way about anything. They will dissect every little thing. Um, and that's great. But on the other hand, also realize this happened almost a year ago. And while it's reality TV, sure. You know, it's a heightened sense of reality. You, they plucked us from all over the world, well, all over the country, threw us into this bubble and then gave us a whole different set of circumstances than we're used to to dealing with. Mm. So of course tension is going to be high. We're tired. We're nervous. Everything is is like manifesting itself in such a weird weird way so things come out wrong sure um do you regret like stabbing that girl on the show and watching her bleed to death no no not at all no okay uh mostly because she stole the last the last now and later and (laughs) my sugar was low (laughs) now uh one of the challenges that we saw this week was a shakes queer (laughs) challenge Uh where they had you guys all in about 30 minutes Memorize a it's hastily. How how much time did you guys have? Everybody's like having different stories about this. Well, it depends on which team you talk to. Oh, so the, <laughs> the so winning team or the losing? The winning team. team had more time to prepare than the losing <coughs> no. team. No, do you guys? We both all have... had the same amount of time. Okay, I don't recall. Pearl says it was thirty minutes. I don't recall exactly. Um, but it was a, it's a couple of hours. But, you know, we had to sit down, read the script. Memorize the, or divide the parts, memorize the lines, yeah. do a little bit of blocking, and then um, get into drag. So there was obviously enough time to do all of that. Mm. It's not 30 You can minutes. rehearse your lines where you're getting into drag, too, certainly. Exactly. Well, and you know. Well, were I, you guys aware of the other team uh, struggle? 
with the with the challenge or we were not it wasn't okay. until um I, we went first and then because rupaul stopped the cameras and started like yelling and, and threw a punch at one of the girls and then <laughs> well yeah and she <laughs> threw pearls under not pearl through pearls uh, and they um well i don't i don't know exactly what happened because we went and then we came back and we were getting out of drag and the other team comes back we're like this is taking a while I don't know what's going on. Ours was like 30 minutes and this has been an hour and a half. Um, so they come back in and they all look like they have been put through it. And um, I was close with Kennedy. So I, I was just talking to her. I was like, girl, what's going on? What's going on? So she starts telling me like everything that happened. And she said, bitch, she's going to shut off the camera and let us have it. She said, I don't know what's going to go on. I'm just got to go learn these lyrics for this lip sync tomorrow. Okay. Because she knew it was coming. Yeah. Well, so I know it, if I have to lip sync against Kennedy, I'll be going home. Yeah. No. What, was Kennedy turning it out, though? Because, I mean, she's an amazing performer. You've seen her perform. But what we saw on, on the show, may might have been edited, wasn't really... We didn't see her backflips and her, her Well, how are you going to backflip in a full-fitted ball gown? I, like, you know, rip it off if it's if, you, if you're lip-syncing for your yeah. life. <laughs> you have never met a pageant, bitch, have you? We will not rip our gown for anything. Well, do you feel like uh, Kennedy was holding back in any way in her lip-syncing? She knew Jasmine was going to be the one to go. Um... Everybody knew that Jasmine wanted to go because they didn't show it in the episode. But we came in that next morning and she packed. She packed everything. Oh, she got all her stuff and she was like, here's the food over here. If well, y'all want some, come get it. Maybe she got a little note under her door because uh, the first few seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race, <laughs> the girls that were going like that were going to lip sync for the life. They got a checkout notice like like <laughs> you're you're checking out like Mimi. I'm first got one people from season one, season two. <laughs> well, that did not happen this mm -hmm. year. Well, I will also say, you know, season one and two were. Um, different producers mm. we have different producers well, it's, it's it's like the fourth director of the series now in seven years is so, that right yeah i mm. believe so because you guys i did, think that uh the guillermo del toro was does, directing <laughs> it for a second because you guys that was bianca del rio she won last season <laughs> you guys did mcbitch and romy and juliet yes i have some things i guess they considered some other things uh they were going to do uh the taming of the she male but obviously well, after last year I don't it didn't think go. that'd be a good idea. No, all's well that tucks well. Well, that could be cute. The Oh Mary, Wives of Windsor. <laughs> Much ado about Oh No, She Better Don't. I'm glad that did not happen. The comedy of queers. Mm. Titus, Androgynous. Oh, and, see, now that might have been really cute. <laughs> yeah, ti uh, uh, based on, you know, his Titus Andronicus. And then yeah. The Tempest, She Who Goes Home First. <laughs> 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 you can use all those tonight in your act. <laughs> uh, you have a quote for Pearl. I have a quote. Because Pearl. Because she didn't uh, know who Shakespeare was, right? Yeah. I, not, well, and I didn't know that until I watched until you watched it. it. <laughs> until watched so here's a quote for, from William Shakespeare. Ignorance is the curse of God. Knowledge is the wing whereth we fly to heaven. You dumb bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I added the dumb bitch part. I'm just, you I'm did? Just, I did. It sounded like a soliloquy. <laughs> Now, why is it so important for any performer to understand Shakespeare? Um, I don't really think that it's necessary. I mean, it depends on what kind of performer you want to be and what you want to do with your career. But um, when when they when they get you cast you like are you at acting school or theater yeah, well, school? Yeah, if you want to be an actor, first yes. season, it's first year, it's learn your Shakespeare because that's where it comes from. I mean, that's yeah. where we're still getting a lot of our modern ideas from Shakespeare. I mean, it's all you, recycled. Like what, like what would that be an example of? If you've ever seen any sitcom, it's the same plots and situations that happen, that have happened in Shakespeare plays, you know, like when P2 poor people pretend to be rich uh -huh. and then the, uh, they they fall in love with other two rich people and then they re reveal everybody's poor. And then all of a sudden you've got twin brothers that you never knew existed and they're getting mistaken for one another. I mean, it, it's the, those were the original plot lines. I do, did miss the Seinfeld episode where they had a double um, suicide. <laughs> well, I didn't miss it, but. <laughs> yeah. on, on Facebook, Joel King asked, could you elaborate on the experience after shooting days are over? Are you really locked into your rooms? Yes. Well, um, I won't say that we're locked into the rooms, but we're taped into them. 
And or they put a little scotch tape on it. No, you, you get some duct tape all the way around the door and then masking tape over the peephole. Mm-hmm. So you can't see out. Um, so you can't have like your boyfriend slide something underneath the door like Willem did. No, what's well, my boyfriend's wouldn't fit under the door. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, like a dress or something. You can't. No, absolutely not. And they've got hall monitors. You know, we've got the PAs, and they take turns sitting in a chair at the end of the hallway throughout the night. Throughout the night, every time that we're in the hotel, they are sitting there watching to make sure we don't. God, that's Come a go that's a di- that's a difficult job to be at three in the morning guarding a bunch of drag queens. Yeah, but I will say that it also got very easy for them because when you're at the studio and you're filming for so many hours, six days a week, by the time we, they got us cross dressers back to the hotel, we would take a shower and we would pass out mm-hmm. until it was time to go back and do it all again. Did you have weird dreams when you were? Uh, sort of passing out and falling, you know. I don't remember having any dreams. Oh, really? <laughs> no, because it's so much work. Even when we got back to the hotel, it was still work because we had to go over our lines or our choreography or whatever we were doing for the next day, or we had to learn the lip sync for your life, which, you know, you don't know what that song's going to be until they give it to you a day or two before. And then eventually. And every queen needs to know it. Yes. Well, and that's my problem with, you know, certain people who don't feel that they need to do that. So there were some, there will be some queens in the series who are like, I don't know if it ever, watermelon, watermelon, watermelon. Well, I don't know if it ever affected anybody this season, but I've watched in seasons past and it always irritates me when they don't know their words. It's like, come on, girl. Everybody had the same amount of time. Most of these songs you've heard for years and years and years. Come on, don't just bubblegum watermelon it. (laughs) Carly O. Goodman says, coming from the South, were you a pageant queen? Yes, I'm still a pageant queen. Oh, yeah? I love a pageant. That was my big issue with uh, Violet saying, who is Michelle Visage to judge me? Because I've been paying people to judge me for years and years and years. Um, That's her job, you know? And I think that the only way that you're ever going to get better in your field of entertainment is if you're getting critiqued by somebody. So I might as well pay professionals to critique me. Sure, uh, but I, I can I can also relate to where Violet is coming from, where which is it's like she felt that... Michelle's critiques were seem vague or un, unhelpful. But a critique is whatever you want to do with it. Sure. It's however you interpret it. And she everything took it personally. That, everything that Michelle said to me or about me this entire season, um, I found validity in it. You know, you've got to look and say, well, she's obviously seeing something that's wrong. So if I want to appease her, I need to figure out what I'm doing wrong and fix it. Sure. And not get defensive, because when you get defensive, you've already built that wall and you're never going to conquer it. Well, do you have other drag queens coming to you for advice and how do you... Because one thing I do is I always ask them, well, what kind of feedback do you want from me? Like, what what do you want me to look at? Because the people that otherwise they're going to be like, how did I do? And you said, you did great. You really did it. What is it, Mark, that you say? Yeah, you just say congratulations. Yeah, when it sucked, you, did. you just say congratulations. You <laughs> we really always did it. like to say when we were like when we'd go see other people's plays, our friends and everything. Look at you up there with all those lines. Oh my God, you learned them all. <laughs> you learned them all. <laughs> Not in this case. So. <laughs> the, all the, the the team two didn't memorize any of their lines. No, and oh, that's what I was saying was Kennedy was telling me what a, a clusterfuck it was. But I had no idea until I watched the episode last mm-hmm. night uh, exactly what happened. And, you know, I'm we're all in a texting group. We talk to each other all the time. I told you guys this on the red carpet. This is the bitchiest season, but we're also the closest. Like I love all you girls. And, and, we're and you guys super are such close. good. You're good eggs. Yeah. Well, Some it, of these girls that we've seen in past seasons... Are, are kind of mean or insecure or like just vicious. Yeah, and we love each other very yeah. much. We all talk every day. Um, so I was talking to them last night, and uh, a couple of the girls were like, "The editing made it look better than it was in rehearsal." Mm-hmm. They're like, <laughs> "It was even worse." That's what they said about Laganja that she actually got a really favorable edit. <laughs> oh, some of those I heard girls that too. Had to be for three hours with her screaming like, "Oh, the little worm in the Simpsons where they find in the backyard that." <laughs> If it if it doesn't get any attention, it dies. Uh, the screams. The screaming worm. <laughs> uh, Lucy Stuhl wants to talk about the bearded queen challenge and who's okay. your favorite 
bearded queen besides me. Mm. Lucy Stool. <laughs> Lucy Stool. What a fabulous name. She's um, a really scat. Be- she's, a, she's into scat, but she's a, a bearded queen here in Chicago who's kind of known for that yeah. look. You know? Well, I mean, does she want to know who my favorite... What my favorite bearded look was from the show, or just who my favorite bearded queen is? She wants you to say uh, her name. Is what she her wants. Lucy Stool. <laughs> I am such a fan. <laughs> Whoever you are, uh, I love you. Whoever you are. <laughs> uh, Dara Hughes says apparently Rue stopped filming during the other team's Shakespeare play this week to give them a tough and tender talk. Can you tell us more about this? I can't because I wasn't there. Mm. Um, I've pretty much elaborated on everything that I was told by the other team. And I've also heard conflicting stories as well. Like one person from that team will say, oh, yeah, she stopped and she slapped us in the face and she kicked us in the shins. And then the next person will say, no, she didn't stop at all. We just took that much time because Mm. we were terrible. I heard and I forgot. I'm so sorry, listeners. I forgot about this. But I heard that RuPaul said something really outrageously funny. That didn't make it on. I think it was you who said it or something on on me on Tumblr or somewhere. Yeah. Oh, I'm not on the Tumblr or somewhere on the on your social media. You somebody said so, so people help me out here. I forgot to I write don't it know. down. But RuPaul said all sorts of like intense shit. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't think it was me. When she told Pearl to wake up, she said it three times. Oh, she did. No, that was intense because yeah. you know even without all the the tinny sound effects in the background and the thunder and the lightning and everything just to see RuPaul break that that gla- her glare with the camera and look directly at Pearl and go wake up <laughs> this is uh, the quote RuPaul said make it work make it work fucking make it happen I don't want to hear any goddamn excuses anymore Bring me the axe. Bring me the axe. <laughs> it was definitely. You're, you're standing there when she's screaming that. No, I wasn't. No, you weren't there. Okay, because I was, was in other... Untucked. Oh, you were backstage. Yeah, and you couldn't hear anything. Okay. Yeah, no, we were in Untucked, so I didn't even get to see any of that until uh, I watched the episode. That shit is intense. It RuPaul is also intense. like when he was. Uh, what was it? Look at this animated gif he sticked oh, his with fingers the... in his mouth <laughs> and shot himself in the head. Oh, good lord! He's taking all the loads. <laughs> well, <laughs> girl's got to do what she has to do. That just, you know, and I having f- you know, we're currently filming Cooking with Drag Queens, and mm-hmm. I, I, some of these girls uh, are a little tough to deal with. Are they? <laughs> surprise, surprise! Gender nonconforming <laughs> artists somehow you know have a lot of issues. Who knew? Oh, but I, I would me. think all artists and all I have more issues too. than TV Guide, honey. I just, yeah, it's. You seem like very down to earth. You seem like all your demons have been sorted out. Well, here's the thing. Here's one thing that I would like to say. You know, I'm I'm getting flack for being blunt, but I went into this entire experience going, I'm just going to be me. Um, I'm going to hold myself to the same standards that I would if I was just at home with my friends. And I'm sorry if it comes off the wrong way, but it always comes from a good place. Like sure. in Orlando, I'm called I'm, like they refer to me as the nicest bitch you'll ever meet. Because I'll give you the bra off my back, but I'm going to read you to filth for not bringing your own. You know, like, so I think that especially, you know, when things get edited and certain things get clipped out just for time's sake, I'm not saying I'm getting a bad at it. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, you don't know yet. Well, no, but I mean, like in in Untucked in particular, I don't think it's a bad edit. I think that there's just there's key moments that are missing that would fully explain um, exactly why I say or do some things that I do, but I'm just a blunt person. And if I ask a question, it's a legit question. Like, come on, give me the answer. That way we can all move on and have a good time. Well, bless their heart. And bless your soul, which is Southern <laughs> for fuck you. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, and, and it always comes from a place of wanting to learn and to understand. Yeah. Because I went into this going, I've been doing this for 10 years. Yeah, I'm a pageant queen. I've done this and I've done that. And I've had a lot of great mm-hmm. opportunities. But I've also been in my own little bubble in Orlando for most of this career. And I wanted to learn about different queens from different parts of the country. Mm-hmm. Well, you're certainly a big personality, and of course, you're gonna, you know, big personalities aren't always gonna mix well with other big personalities, or, you know, that mix is gonna be fantastic and fun. Yeah. Uh, Lola Von Miramar wants to know what your favorite color is. I guess it would be red? No, blue. 
Aww. Like your eyes. Like my eyes. A lot yeah. of people ask me, like, do you wear contacts? No, I don't wear contacts. These are my eyes. And you turn to Trixie Mattel and go. Yeah. <laughs> but see, I always want to, I want to do that, but it always looks like a dog with peanut butter on the roof of its mouth. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, yeah. Melissa Hosek wants to know what's your, what are you wanting out of this? Uh, what opportunities you'd love to come your way? Because you've pe- played uh, Hedwig. I played Hedwig for two years, and you know, um, no, it seems nobody wants to play Hedwig on Broadway. It's like the the actors keep taking the roles uh, and then quit because well, it's really intense. It's hard. It, it's very hard. I mean, I did it for two years, eight performances a week for most of the run. And um, I wasn't smoking then. I was going to the gym. I was making sure that I, I kept myself in good enough shape to do it. But it was still really, 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 really rough. So I can only imagine trying to do it on Broadway with that caliber of performance. Because it's got to be 10 times as big as what I did for a 200-seat theater when you're on Broadway with that many people. And now you're, now you're like smoking every Oh, now hour. I'm a chain smoker. And I'm gaining too much weight. Like I could probably make it through about three songs. Three ballads. What's your favorite song from Hedwig that you feel like is really satisfying to sing? Because um, I, I would imagine like Wig in the Box. Wig in the Box. Uh, or Midnight Radio. Sits right. Well, Wig in the Box sits right on the break in my my uh, vocal cords. Um, so that one, it, it was good once I figured out how to do it my way and still have it sound really good. Um a lot of people think Origin of Love is like, oh, the song, and it's beautiful. And Midnight Radio is fantastic, too. But my favorite was Wicked Little Town. Mm. The first one, not the reprise, but I love the first one because it's so simple. It's just a piano, and it's just you, and you're just sitting there, and you're just singing. And I never, ever remember singing that or performing that in any performance that I did of the show. Because you lose yourself. In I, that's the one moment in the show that I always just lost myself completely. And just reflect on all the choices that you make in your life. It's just one of those cathartic kind of moments for me. And, that's and as why an that actor, you're, lo- you're sort of like looking for your own personal experiences mm-hmm. to, to channel the emotions. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's kind of the turning point in the show anyway. Sure. That's where he starts to go really downhill with everything and then it just kind of takes on its own life and everything explodes. Um, so in order to let yourself go there and, and make it authentic and not kind of false like a lot of people tend to do. I don't, I, I don't like to tell people I'm not an actor. I'm a reactor. I want, it, I want the situations to be real. I want it to be as real as possible. So it bothers me when people just go through the motions. And if you're going to let yourself not go through the motions and really experience this, you've got to find that moment that's going to make it click for you where you can have that downward spiral. Is there any way to prepare for what you are going through right now? Because it it seems like your career is just exploding and you're very likely to win this season of RuPaul's Drag Race. Oh, God, you're sweet to say that. Um, well, I have, you know, RuPaul call, drunk dials me at three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> me too. I want her ginger men's to win. I mean, it's very clear from the editing so far that we've seen that you're uh, going to go very far, if not take the whole thing. Well, I I don't know. <laughs> from your mouth to God's ears. Um and, and, I said it, but just want to say for the record here. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course she can't comment yeah. on that. She well, just, but I want the listeners, thank you to the listeners to, to acknowledge that. Because we've been pretty good. We we were like thinking Courtney Act might get it because she was very strong. But Bianca immediately. But as soon as Bianca see, came yeah. on the screen, we're like, oh, she could win. And yeah. this season, it's kind of tricky knowing who's going to go far. Well, that's what I love about this season. And I've told people yeah. that from day one. I was like, Even if I wasn't on season seven, mm-hmm. I would still tell you this is like the best season that we've had. Because other than fame, you know, most of us were pretty much plucked from obscurity. Kennedy and I were known in the pageant circle. But outside of that, nobody knew who we were. And. It, it makes it more of a tighter race mm-hmm. with everyone. Everyone's learning us uh, or learning our quirks and our personalities at once instead of like last season where almost every girl was known on a national level mm. beforehand. Well, Ginger Minch, we love you so much. And you. you're, you're, as you lose yourself in that song, we are losing ourselves in this uh, interview. 
Because the time is, I mean, we've, we've been talking for an hour. It's really extraordinary to hear all your great stories. And we expect nothing but great things from you. Oh, well, yeah. we'll see. Now, <laughs> Sorry uh, to disappoint you. <laughs> well, uh, what I'd love to invite you to do is to, to make some uh, ginger pie <gasps> with us in the kitchen. We'll try my pie. Tasty pie. Because uh, I guess in the Ameri- you know you want the pie. As long as it's not made with fish. Uh, back in the day, in the I'm American allergic. War of Independence, uh, the thing to do was called chess pies, and they're kind of a thing in the South, right? Yeah, uh, custard pies. Uh huh. And there's this uh, wonderful I found. Which the- P.S. I don't know why, because custard does not hold up in the heat, but. Continue. Well, there were pies that like were <laughs> almost kind of like cookies. Yeah, you know? no, they, I know exactly. What they you mean. they kept well in your in your pie chest or chess, and that's mm-hmm. why they call it chess pies. And so they make these uh, really wonderful ginger pies that are great with a cup of coffee. And I thought it would be amazing <laughs> to do that with you. Yeah, let's do it for cooking with drag queens. So I'm very into coffee. When you come back in town next month. Yes. Can I'll we be, follow I'm, you with the video cameras? You're a monthly visitor. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Can we follow you with the video cameras and watch you get ready as you tuck back you know, in your hotel room? Sure. Well, see, that's the beautiful thing, though. I'm fat, so I haven't tucked in my whole 10-year career. It tucks itself. <laughs> well, J- uh, Jinx Monsoon is very proud that she doesn't tuck. She just puts layers on top. A lot of girls yeah. do, because you well, just smush it. Yeah, exactly. Well, mm. and like... If you bend down at the the right angle at the right time, just as you yank your hip pads up, yeah, everything just goes into place. <laughs> Ginger Minge, you can learn more about her at uh, thegingermingedivinediva.com, right? Is that what? Sure, why not? What is your URL? Um, what is the URL? I'm not into this newfangled <laughs> shit you kids the are talking internet. about. Oh, internet. Oh, the, the, the www. Your website. Um, it's just gingerminge.com. Wow, that's a great URL because a lot of you know queens don't usually get their names. As they, somebody <laughs> else gets it first. Well, and see, that's the lucky thing that nobody really knew who the fuck I was because as soon as I got back from filming, I was like, let me just see. Especially since it's you know it's a double entendre, mm-hmm. it's such a filthy name. I was like, I'm sure it's a porn site by now. <laughs> but no, I, it was there. I got it for like fifteen bucks. And, and you can get your official Ginger Minch T-shirt. The Glamour Toad. Mm. Yeah. For the low price of $30 plus shipping and handling. Is it? I, I haven't seen you it. You don't even know your own price. I don't. <laughs> Merchandise. I t- if it was up to me, I'd give it all away for free just because I just, I fucking love people and like I want them to have it and I want them to like me and I want them to enjoy my things, but I need your money. <laughs> Bitch, and we need your money. Remember, Feast of Fun is made possible because of your financial support. Go to feastoffun.com slash store and make a contribution. Yeah, I'm even a subscriber. Oh, you yeah. are. I am. I pay my $14 a month. Yay. I love you. Thank you so much you for too. doing that. And thanks for coming on the show. And I must have gotten at least like $14 worth of soup, soup and coffee today. I'm sure you did. It was homemade <laughs> soup made from bones. I want to remind <laughs> folks, too, that we can't do the show without your support. So if you're not a Plus member yet, consider signing up today at feastoffun.com slash plus. And we have fantastic T-shirts for sale at feastoffun.com uh, uh, slash store and we also have comics there uh, generously donated from Northwest Comics you can get some nice packages of comics there oh, all LGBT packages. themed you got binders full of comics binders full Amanda of comics. binders yeah. <laughs> hey kids remember that uh, Cookie Drag Queens premieres sometime soon in April if, <laughs> if we get 10,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel we will start unleashing little sneak peeks mm-hmm. Ooh. Where it's, it's you know it's it, it's interesting because we've fo- gotten footage of the girls that we can't air. Why? Because they're they're, they're committing illegal acts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't put this on the internet because they'll get arrested. But I can give it the sneak peek. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Every time people would ask me, why the hell is season seven taking so long to premiere? Because <laughs> they're trying to edit around my filthy fucking mouth and <laughs> and Violet's naked body. She's got a gorgeous body. Okay. She's super skinny. Um, have you ever she, seen Violet do her aerialist act? Yeah. That's an amazing thing. I told her, I said, bitch, you are so stupid if you don't start your very own Cirque du Soleil front show. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Ginger Minge, we love you. Thank I love you so you much. Too. Bye, love everybody. You Bye. Bye.